So, this is the first of two guest lectures to be given on the 2018 Economic Policy Analysis 3 course at the University of Adelaide by Associate Professor Philip Lorne. Phil is Senior Research Fellow at the Centre of Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle. He's also a Research Fellow with the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity, a member of the Wakefield Futures Group in South Australia, and a current visiting lecturer, as some of you know, here at Adelaide Uni. He is the author and editor of eight books, along with 55 journal articles and more than 40 book chapters. His most recent book was Resolving the Climate Change Crisis, the Ecological Economics of Climate Change, published by Springer in 2016, which is a core text on the climate change course at this university. He is currently engaged in the major project of developing genuine progress indicator accounts on a comparable basis for virtually every country on Spaceship Earth. He gave a presentation on this subject last month at the 2018 Conference of the International Society for Ecological Economics in Mexico City and spoke on it last week at the second International Conference in Modern Monetary Theory at the New School in New York City. So now I'll pass you over to Phil. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is the first of the two lectures. Uh, I'm going to talk about this alternative to GDP as a measure of economic welfare. It's called a genuine progress indicator on Tuesday. I'm going to talk today about some fundamentals of ecological economics. You may have heard of environmental economics. Ecological economics is quite different to uh, environmental economics. And I'm just going to talk about some basic principles of it, of ecological economics, which will serve as a basis for what I'm going to say next Tuesday. Okay? Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to go through these. I'm going to stick to what I've got on the slides. Uh, I, I don't want to expand too much on what I've got, otherwise I won't finish the lecture. Um, but the sort of standard uh, definition, or the, the definition of standard economics, is that it involves allocating scarce resources in a ma manner that best satisfies human needs and wants. And of course, when you first do your standard economics, uh, the three main questions that are asked uh, the first is what to produce, okay, and that's, that's part of uh, the issue of uh, efficiency, allocative efficiency, how to produce it, also an efficiency-related uh, question, and for whom equity. Although standard economics doesn't really deal with the equity issue all that well, it tends to focus more on what to produce uh, and how to produce it. Ecological economics is a bit different. Okay, it's, it's still... Uh, focuses on the allocation of scarce resources, which are means, uh, but in an ecologically sustainable, equitable and efficient manner to best satisfy human goals or ends. And so it still asks some of the uh, same questions, what to produce. So if, uh, from that point of view, it's, it's similar uh, to standard economics, how to produce it. Uh, but ecological economists focus a lot more on for whom the equity issue and they probably add a fourth question, and that is, with what and for how long? Which is related to the ecological sustainability issue, which ecological economists focus on uh, quite a lot. Um, one way to consider the difference between ecological economics and standard economics is with respect to what's called an ends mean spectrum. So at the top of the spectrum is the ultimate end. I've got a question mark there. Who knows what the ultimate end is? Depends on uh, cultural factors, religion you practice or what have you. Uh, essentially it's a, an ethical ordering principle which we use, whether we like it or not, as a means of ranking intermediate ends, or right, needs and wants basically. So the intermediate ends um, are things like income and wealth, standard of health and education, sense of purpose and making contributions to society, desired leisure time, love and sense of belongingness. You could add a lot more to that particular list. Now to uh, in order to achieve or meet uh, or satisfy those intermediate ends, which are ranked 
according to the ultimate end. Of course, you need intermediate means. Things like consumer goods, TVs, iPads, clothes, food, producer goods, plant machinery and equipment, infrastructure, which is provided by government and the private sector, and labour. Right, so they're combined to provide the intermediate uh, means to satisfy intermediate ends, which we rank with respect to our, our ultimate end. And of course, to produce the intermediate means, we need the ultimate means. And the ultimate means is uh, natural resources, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it soon, uh, can be referred to as low entropy matter energy. Resources are a form of matter and energy. It's low entropy in the sense it's very highly ordered and structured, and it's uh, useful in terms of production purposes, as opposed to high entropy matter and energy, which is waste. So the difference between low entropy matter energy and high entropy matter energy, low entropy is resources, high entropy is waste. And you can see that standard economics tends to focus on the intermediate segment of the ends means, ends means spectrum, the intermediate means and the intermediate ends, whereas uh, ecological economics tends to uh, focus on the entire spectrum. It is concerned with uh, how we might order our ends and it's particularly, uh, it particularly stresses the importance of the ultimate means. Okay. So ecological starts, uh, economic starts by considering economic activity for what it is and especially uh, in terms of the context in which it is conducted. The standard economic sort of view uh, that you learn uh, early on in your first year economics, uh, it represents the economy as a, a circular flow of exchange value. Okay, so you've got this thing called the economy. Um, you have so in its most basic form, you don't have government, you just have firms and households. Uh, firms produce goods and services, household, households consume goods and services, households provide uh, labour manufactured capital and natural resources. So the factors of production, okay, wages, profits, rents uh, represent, of course, the fact of payments, which uh, is used in order to calculate GDP using the income approach. Okay. And, of course, the uh, goods and services produced by firms um, go back to households. All right, households purchase those goods and consume them. And, of course, what they spend in order to purchase those goods uh, involves the expenditure approach to calculating GDP, which is, of course, the national product. So this circular flow model, it's fine. If what we're considering is the circular flow of exchange values for macro accounting, macroeconomic accounting purposes but it's next to useless as a means of considering the ecological sustainability of the economic process. So uh, what ecological economists do is they place the economy within the greater ecosphere. Now, we can still represent the economy as the circulation of exchange values, but it's not the circulation of physical goods and services. Okay. So maintain uh, the economic process Resources have to be extracted from the ecosphere. They enter the economy. They're used to produce goods and services. And once the goods and services have been consumed, uh, that matter and energy exits as waste. So the ultimate output of economic activity is waste. Uh, we can also look at it in another way. Okay, so I've, I've expanded that a little bit. Um, the uh, ecosphere is driven, of course, by the energy provided by the sun. You get a bit of a heat loss, although we're living in a world now where the amount going in is a bit more than uh, what's going out, and it's called climate change, global warming, but that's, that's another point, a separate issue. Uh, but here I've got resources entering the economy, uh, waste exiting the economy, and of course those resources are then allocated to produce the various goods and services. Okay. But as you can see, the economy is a subsystem of the natural environment. It depends upon the natural environment, the ecosphere for resources, uh, and uh, once the goods and services produced are consumed, of course, that matter and energy exits the economy and returns back to the natural environment, environment as waste. Uh, the important thing here is that this throughput of matter and energy, which is the input of resources and the output of waste, uh, is critical in terms of ecological sustainability. Allocation of the incoming resource flow is not. Okay, so what you do with that stuff when it enters the economy is irrelevant in terms of ecological sustainability. You may allocate it in such a way to get more pollution than you ought to, but the total level of waste will be determined by the total 
quantity of resource input, which I'll talk about soon. Okay? The problem with standard economics is this view that if you get the allocation issue sorted out, you have ecological sustainability. Okay? That makes as much sense as saying if we have an efficient allocation of resources, uh, resources will be allocated equitably. After all, ecological sustainability is a form of equity. It's intergenerational equity as opposed to what we normally think of equity, which is intragenerational equity. So I'm going to talk about two main areas of economics, production and consumption. You know, you learn that when you do your uh, first year economics. Um, ecological economists uh, define production as the rearrangement of matter and energy embodied in the incoming resource flow through the use of resource transforming agents. That's, you now KH is human made capital. The reason why I've called it human made capital because there's another form of capital I'm going to talk about, and that's natural capital. That's your forest, your fisheries, and so forth. Uh, and labour to add use value to the ma uh, matter energy embodied in the resources. So we extract resources from the natural environment, we apply human made capital and labour in the form of production, and we produce goods and services. And that includes, of course, human made capital. Uh, we sometimes forget that the, some of the goods that we make aren't just consumer goods. They are plant machinery and equipment to replace worn out plant machinery and equipment or to grow the stock of plant machinery and equipment. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next slide, but just to uh, give you some idea, I, I've assumed here that the uh, number of units of matter and energy embodied in resources is 100. And the UV represents, let's say, use value. So resources do have use, some sort of use value. Okay, a log, you can sit on a log, but you'd rather sit on a wooden chair. All right, so we convert the log to a wooden chair and we add use value to it. It's more comfortable. But uh, resources do have some form of use value. Now, during the production process, some of those units of matter and energy will be embodied in the goods and services produced. But there will be some immediate waste. Okay? And I've got there the, uh, the quantity of, immediate quantity of waste is 50 units of matter and energy. Now, the 50 units of matter and energy embodied in the goods and services eventually become waste. All right, once the goods and services have been consumed or they're worn out through use. So it turns out, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this soon, uh, that the quantity of matter and energy entering the economy as resources ultimately equals the quantity of matter and energy that exits as waste. So production is a value-adding process. We can talk in terms of the technical, technical efficiency of production. E. e is basically equal to Q on R. So if I just go back here, uh, I had Q. So that's, that's uh, the quantity of goods and services. Uh, and R, of course, is resource input. And you can probably see there, the technical efficiency of production is 50%. Right? Because 50% of the matter and energy embodied in the resources ended up embodied in the final goods and services. And the other 50% uh, was waste immediate waste, because ultimately it's all waste. Okay, so E equals equal to Q on R, where Q is equal to the matter and energy embodied in goods and services produced, and R is equal to the matter and energy embodied in resource input. Now this is where uh, I talked a little bit about the quantity of uh, matter and energy entering the economy equals that which exits the economy. We need to talk a little bit about the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Um, I know for you, you think, well, this is economics. What uh, does the first and second laws of thermodynamics have to do with economics? Well, the economic process is a uh, resource transforming process. It's a physical transformation process, and it's subject to the first and second laws of thermodynamics. What are these laws? The first law is the law of conservation of matter and energy. So we cannot uh, destroy or create matter and energy. It's in we're incapable of doing it. So what that means is that the quantity of matter and energy entering the economy as resources must equal the quantity of matter and energy eventually exiting the economy as waste. And that's why you had 100 entering and ultimately 100 units of matter and energy exiting. The second law of thermodynamics is the entropy law. And this relates to the quality of matter and energy. So even though we can't destroy the quantity or create or increase the quantity, sorry, of matter and energy, uh, we can affect the quality, and we will. When we use matter and energy, we, if we, we uh, reduce the quality of the matter and energy uh, that has entered the economy as natural resources. So the quality of matter and energy entering the economy 
as resources is better than the quality of the matter and energy eventually exiting the economy as waste. Or we can look at it another way, the, quantity, the quality of the matter and energy exiting as waste is worse than the quality of the matter and energy that originally entered as natural resources. Um, so, what are the implications of the first? Well, the first law basically means that the technical efficiency of production cannot exceed 100%. Combine that with the entropy law, and it means that technical efficiency of production must be something less than 100%. Okay. So you can't have 100% technical efficiency of production. E is less than one. So what does technological progress do? Okay, so technological progress appears to reduce the amount of resources required to produce a given quantity of output. All it's really doing is it's reducing the waste immediately generated through production. So if I go to the next slide, that year one, that's exactly what I had up before. Okay, 100 units of matter and energy, 50 embodied in uh, final goods and services, 50 immediately became waste. E is equal to Q on R, equal to 0.5, equal to 50%. What does technological progress do? Well, let's assume we're using the same quantity of resources okay, to produce goods and services. If E uh, increases to 0.6 or 60%, it means now we can produce a larger quantity of goods and services, embodying 60 units of matter and energy, which means only 40 units of matter and energy uh, immediately become waste. Of course, that the total 100 ultimately ends up as waste. And then, of course, we might reach some point in the future where if we're still using 100 units of matter and energy, we get to a point where, uh, say, 99.9 .9, uh, units of matter and energy uh, are embodied in the final goods and services that we're producing, which, of course, means constitutes a larger quantity of goods and services, and the amount of uh, immediate waste is, uh, of course, 0.1%. Uh, but you can see here that it is impossible to produce uh, more than one, or goods and services embodying more than 100 units, or perhaps 99.9, .9, you can never reach 100, but let's say more than 100 units of matter and energy from resources embodying 100 units of matter and energy. It's thermodynamically impossible. What does that mean? It means that you can't keep producing more with less. There's a limit. There's a thermodynamic limit. So what is uh, technology and production? What are some of the implications? What I've done there is, now it wouldn't necessarily be as smooth as this, as this but what I've done is I've uh, got a, a line representing what might happen to the technical efficiency of production over time. And you can see the dotted line is where E is equal to 1. That's the thermodynamic limit. And over time, we expect the value of E to rise. All right, I perhaps we've had something there on the horizontal axis, T naught or what have you. But at that particular point in time, you can see... Now, that green uh, bracket, that's represent, that, that vertical distance is representing, let's say, 100 units of matter and energy embodied in the resources. And given uh, what E is at that particular point in time, blue uh, bracket there represents the vertical distance uh, or, or the vertical distance of that particular bracket represents the... Uh, matter and energy embodied in the goods and services produced at that point in time from R, and of course the remainder is waste. And you can imagine that if, as you move uh, over time, forward over time, and E increases, then from a given amount of resource input, the quantity of goods and services increases and the amount of waste falls. But there's a limit to how much Q can rise for a given amount of resource input. So what does more Q over time mean in terms of resource input? Well, we might have something like this. Here I've got, on the bottom line there, I've got Q rising at, let's say, a certain percentage uh, per year over a particular period of time. And here I've got the top line, I've got what might be the resource input. And you can see the gap between the two is shrinking because the amount of waste immediately produced in production is falling because efficiency, technical efficiency is rising. But, of course, that gap, whilst it narrows, it's impossible for R to be less than Q. So you may get to a point where, uh, if everything lines up quite well, where you might be able to produce it a bit more and reduce resource input. But ultimately, as you produce more, 
uh, real output and you reach thermodynamic limits, it means you use more resource input. Can't avoid it. So this raises this issue of uh, the impossibility of decoupling. Decoupling is this idea that you can break the nexus between resource input and the production of goods and services. Uh, and it would be equivalent to this, where you've got Q going up, you've got, say, R starting to uh, go up, uh, the gap between Q and R declining, and then getting to a point where R starts to fall towards zero. In fact, t uh, uh, if you're talking about absolute decoupling, you're talking about uh, R moving towards zero. Well, in fact, beyond TN, that's impossible. Okay? R must be higher than Q. So absolute decoupling is impossible. If you're using, uh, if you're producing more output, you must ultimately be uh, um, using more resources. So that's production. What about consumption? Ecological economists think of consumption very differently to standard economists. Consumption is usually seen as consumption expenditure. Economists don't see it that way. All right? Consumption expenditure is just expenditure on consumption goods. Consumption is something completely different again. Uh, consumption involves, so remember, production involves the rearrangement of matter and energy, all right, that were embodied in natural resources, using capital and labour to produce goods and services, and you add value in the process. Uh, consumption is the disarrangement of matter and energy embodied in the goods and services produced, and therefore the destruction of the use value originally added to resources in production. So consumption is a value-destroying process. Production is a value-adding process. Consumption is a value-destroying process. Of course, there are two types of, of goods. There are, there are non-durable goods. How do we uh, consume them? Uh, we consume them directly. I've got an apple, I eat it. But I don't eat televisions. Okay, but we, in a sense, consume televisions every time we turn them on and off. We wear them out. So durable goods, we consume them in the form of wearing them out or depreciation uh, and... Uh, Non-durable goods, we tend to directly consume them. Food, drink, uh, and, so, and, and pet, well, we don't drink petrol, but we burn petrol in order to run our cars. So consumption is a necessary evil to enjoy the use value embodied in goods and services. So if you buy something which you hope is going to last 10 years and it breaks after two years and you complain about it, what you're really complaining about is consumption. Okay. Uh, and if we can reduce the rate of consumption uh, to enjoy the same use value from production, that's going to be a gain. Now, that might not increase GDP. In fact, it might reduce the size of GDP. And when I talk about the genuine progress indicator on Tuesday, it's likely to increase the GPI, even though it may be reducing the size of the GDP. That's next lecture. What about in terms of ecological sustainability? I, I mentioned that ecological economists focus very heavily on that. Um, that related to the fourth sort of question that economists ought to be asking. Well, clearly we need, in order to produce a given quantity of output, we need a minimum irreducible quantity of resource input, which of course means a minimum uh, quantity of waste output. Remember, the resources entering the economy eventually uh, exit as, as waste. Uh, and to produce and maintain the economy, only KN, now that's natural capital, so I'm talking now not human-made capital, but natural capital, uh, can provide a constant flow of resources, and only natural capital can safely assimilate wastes up to a point. They can do it up to a point. Um, the emission of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere means that the natural environment, uh, as much as it can uh, destroy and assimilate greenhouse gases, the level of greenhouse gases has exceeded the natural environment's ability to safely assimilate them, and that's why the concentration of greenhouse gases is rising in the atmosphere. So the natural environment can deal with waste, but only up to a point. So ecological sustainability means you need to maintain a minimum stock of natural capital. You must keep natural capital intact. How would you do that? Well, there are various things you would have to do, but three basic sustainability precept precepts are this. Uh, in terms of renewable uh, natural capital, so I'm talking about forests, fisheries and so forth, uh, you extract resources no greater than renewable natural uh, capital can regenerate. So as long as you're not, the rate at which you're harvesting resources doesn't exceed the capacity of a forest to regenerate, you can have timber forever. 
But if you uh, extract timber at a rate greater than it can regenerate, of course, you'll just start depleting the stock until it's uh, completely gone. So you have to make sure that H, the rate of harvest, is less than or equal to the yield, which is the regeneration rate. What about in relation to non-renewable uh, resources, non-renewable natural capital? Well, of course, it doesn't renew itself. So you, in a sense, you really can't uh, use it, exploit it sustainably. But there is a way around it. I could go into some detail, but I won't. But basically, uh, what is required is that non-renewable resources should be uh, extracted no greater than we can, can cultivate renewable natural capital substitutes to replace depleted uh, non-renewable natural capital. Now, of course, that raises the issue as to whether or not there are renewable resource substitutes for some forms of natural uh, non-renewable natural capital, and there probably aren't. But that just means that uh, you need to ensure that whatever you're producing at a point in time, that you wean yourself off that non-renewable resource before it's completely depleted. Otherwise, if that's a, an essential input, you won't be able to produce what you've been producing in the past. And as far as waste goes, well, you generate waste at a rate no greater than the ecosphere can safely assimilate those wastes. So W, waste, less than or equal to A, the assimilative capacity of the natural environment. So as long as you are adhering to those three rules, you're operating sustainably. If you just violate one of those rules, you're operating unsustainably. OK, now for a little bit of ecological macroeconomics. Uh, ecological economists uh, are more interested in the, at the macroeconomic level, economic welfare rather than GDP. They define economic welfare as equal to the sum of the benefits of economic activity minus the sum of the costs at the macroeconomic level. Uh, the problem with GDP, GDP is a fantastic measure of production, but of course it just adds everything, whether it's good or bad, whether it's a benefit or a cost. Uh, okay, so I want you to imagine that on the horizontal axis here, you've got the physical scale of the economy. Okay, and as you move along the horizontal axis, the, the economy is getting bigger. Okay, as that's happening, we would expect... Now, I'm not going to go into uh, the explanation in detail today. I might talk a little bit about it on Tuesday. That UB represents uncancelled benefits. Just think of them as benefits for now, all right? Benefits. And the UC is costs, all right? I want you to think. Now, of course, as the economy grows, we can expect benefits to go up at a diminishing rate. That's your basic principle of diminishing marginal benefit. And we can expect the cost to go up at an increasing rate. Now, I've drawn a vertical line at a particular point, and the reason for that is if we want to operate sustainably, there's going to be, for a given uh, level of technological know-how, there's going to be a scale, SS, on the horizontal axis, where if the economy grows beyond that, the quantity of resources that would be required and the waste generated would, would uh, violate at least one of the sustainability presets. So between zero and SS, the economy is sustainable. It's at a size that, uh, in order to produce goods and services, uh, which requires resources, as we know, and leads to waste, uh, would uh, be a scale that could be ecologically sustained. Is that the desirable scale, perhaps, to operate at? Well, obviously, we don't want to go beyond that. Well, in fact, it isn't. Uh, one of, only one of those sustainable scales is what we might refer to as the optimal scale. Right, and the optimal scale is where you maximise sustainable economic welfare. And it's where you grow the economy up to the point where the marginal benefits of growth equal the marginal costs of growth, which you have no idea uh, of, of, uh, of, of being able to determine through GDP. The aim of the genuine progress indicator, since it counts the benefits and subtracts the costs, is that it gives you some idea as to where you are in relation to the optimal scale. Um, these curves can shift, so they're not static. Uh, I've got here the benefit curve shifting up, uh, and of course, just the way I've drawn it, uh, you can see that sustainable economic welfare um, has risen by moving from the original optimal scale to a new optimal scale. Uh, you'll notice that uh, SS, the maximum sustainable scale, doesn't change. When you increase the benefit, to increase the, uh, or shift the benefit curve up, it means you're getting more benefit from the same stock of goods that the economy is comprised of. How could you do that? Well, you produce better quality goods. You distribute them, distribute them more equitably. 
given that the marginal benefit of consumption is much higher for poor people than it is for, uh, um, for wealthy people. Okay? So the thing is, if you're shifting the benefit curve up and not shifting the cost curve, yes, the optimal scale can increase, but the optimal scale would ultimately, if you weren't shifting the, the cost curve, would be equal to the maximum sustainable scale. Now, would that mean that you could have no increases in sustainable economic welfare? No. You could still have it uh, through a, a shift up of the benefit curve. I might point out, too, that the benefit curve doesn't necessarily rise and, in, ca in fact, can fall. And I'll talk a bit more about that on Tuesday. So bad policy, bad institutional design can lead to the benefit curve, in fact, falling. Um, the bottom one here is where you've got... So I haven't got the benefit curve shifting this time. This time I've got the cost curve shifting. Now, the, the interesting difference here is that when the cost curve shifts, the maximum sustainable scale, because it involves environmental costs, increases. But I've got over here SS max. Why have I got SS max? For the reasons I've already talked about. Okay, you can only grow the economy up to a certain point. You need a certain amount of resources. If, uh, if, if, if the technical efficiency of production uh, at that scale would be uh, nearing or approaching one, then uh, it would be impossible to grow the economy without violating one of the sustainability precepts. So there's an ultimate limit. We're not at that yet, according to that diagram, if that's where we are, but there's an ultimate limit. And again, you can grow the economy, increase the scale of the economy to increase uh, economic welfare, but all that means, of course, is that the optimal scale is increasing in size. I might just point out what this ultimate limit means is, uh, and if you reach that ultimate limit, of course, it means that the only way you can increase economic welfare is to shift the benefit curve up. Uh, that would require a nation to move towards what's referred to as a steady state economy. And that's a non-growing economy. Because okay. you can exceed that if you want to, but you can't do it forever. Uh, and, we, and, and, we, and in fact, I'll put up a diagram which shows that we are exceeding the maximum sustainable scale at the global level. Right, how, how do you exceed that in the short term but not the long term? Well, you just eat into natural capital. All right, remember that maximum sustainable scale uh, is assuming that you're operating in such a way where you're keeping natural capital intact. So you can go beyond that, but you can't stay to the right of that particular point because you'll just deplete your natural capital. And in fact, what will happen is the economy will shrink ultimately as ecological systems collapse and their capacity to provide resources and assimilate waste uh, declines. Which is why uh, ecological economists talk about the need to make the managed transition to a steady state economy because we're going to get a steady state economy whether we like it or not. So either we do it in a nice uh, managed way uh, or it's uh, imposed upon us by mother nature which would be a lot nastier. And in fact, it doesn't have to be nasty at all if you do it manage it properly because as long as you're shifting the benefit curve up, you can have increases in, in sustainable economic welfare without growth. Which of course means an emphasis on quality, on equity and, and of course efficiency. <clears throat> uh, so how do we know when the economy has surpassed its optimal macroeconomic scale? Right, I'll talk a bit more about this on Tuesday. This genuine progress indicator, it's equal to the uh, sustainable economic welfare, or it's meant to represent sustainable economic welfare, is equal to the sum of benefits minus sum of costs. Presumably, if the GPI starts to fall, you've gone beyond the optimal scale. It's not quite as simple as that. I'll talk a bit about that on Tuesday, but it's quite possible that if your GPI is falling, that means you've gone beyond the optimal scale. How do we know uh, when the economy has surpassed its maximum sustainable scale? Well, we can't use an economic indicator for that. So to work out where you are in relation to the optimal macroeconomic scale, that you need an economic indicator, and the GPI is an alternative economic indicator. But in terms of the maximum sustainable scale, you need an ecological indicator. Now, there are lots of ecological indicators that you could use. My favourite is uh, the ecological footprint versus biocapacity. You've probably heard of the ecological footprint indicator. Um, ecological footprint uh, just represents human demands on the ecosphere, whereas uh, biocapacity is what the ecosphere can sustainably supply. Um, if the ecological footprint is greater than biocapacity, it means the scale of the economy is beyond 
SS, the maximum sustainable scale, it means that you're operating ecologically unsustainably. If ecological footprint is less than uh, biocapacity, it means, of course, the scale of the economy is less than the maximum sustainable scale and you're operating ecologically uh, sustainably. If ecological footprint equals biocapacity, you're right at the, op uh, sorry, the ma uh, maximum sustainable scale. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I, I, I perhaps should have jumped in there a bit earlier when I talked a bit about uh, how do we know when the economy has surpassed its optimal macroeconomic scale. I'm just going to give you something uh, to whet your appetite for what we might be seeing or you will be, will be seeing on Tuesday. Uh, I'm in the process of calculating the GPI, hopefully, for every country on Earth. Uh, this is for the USA. And what you can see there is the red line. I'm, I'm still revising it to some extent, but the red line represents the per capita GDP of the USA between 1970 and 2016. The blue line represents per capita GPI. And you can see not only is it a lot lower, but it's not increasing at anywhere near the same rate. In fact, over the study period, the per capita GDP uh, rises by about 125% and the per capita GPI only by about 20 to 25%. That mm, suggests perhaps the US economy may or may not, or may, sorry, have uh, uh, still be approaching its optimal scale because the per capita GPI is rising. But I'll talk a little bit more about that on Tuesday because uh, it's not a precise indicator of uh, where you are in relation to optimal macroeconomic scale. And it's got everything to do with the shift in those curves. Right, so you, you can be at a scale which is smaller than the optimal scale, grow the economy, presumably your economic welfare should rise, because you, but if the curves are shifting, uh, the, the uh, benefit curve shifting down and the cost curve shifting up at a rate sufficient that even though you're growing the economy at a particular rate, you can have a situation where your economic welfare falls even though you're short of the optimal scale. And you can have a situation where you're beyond optimal scale, where your GPI can rise, if you're shifting the curves apart from each other faster than you're growing the economy. But of course, there is an ultimate optimal scale. It just means that you weren't at it if you're shifting the curves out because of bad policy, bad institutional design and so forth. Um, okay, so getting back to the ecological footprint, um, this is the ecological footprint versus biocapacity at the global level. Uh, sorry, it's a bit dated. Uh, I would have liked to have got a more recent one. It's 1961 to 2001. That dotted line represents one Earth, the Earth's biocapacity. Uh, the sort of reddy, browny sort of line at the top there uh, represents the ecological footprint at the global level. And you can see at about 1985, the global economy uh, the ecological footprint was about equal to biocapacity. So beyond 1985, the global economy uh, surpassed its maximum sustainable scale. That's about 1.2 Earths. It's now about 1.7. Okay. What does that mean, 1.7 Earths? You might say, well, okay, we've only got one Earth. How can... Again, it's what I said before. Uh, you're able to um, operate as if you've got more than one planet by eating into the natural capital that you have. So 1.7 Earths basically means that in order to sustain the level of... Uh, resource use and waste generation uh, as it is at present. So to do it on a sustainable basis, you would need 1.7 Earths. And of course, we've only got one Earth, so it's unsustainable. Um, OK, ecological macroeconomics. Uh, does the ecological footprint, so just think of that diagram. In fact, I've just given it away. Uh, does that uh, the ecological footprint look like any of the diagrams I, I looked at earlier. Yes, it does. Uh, if you go back to the one where I showed that uh, absolute decoupling is impossible, if Q goes up, which might be gross world product, which it is, it's rising at around about 2 to 3% per year. If we look at uh, uh, R, you can see that it ought to be increasing, and it is. That would be equivalent to the ecological footprint of the planet. So uh, we have evidence supporting, sorry, uh, the fact that the ecological footprint is rising and will continue to rise whilst gross world product continues to increase. And it's more than likely, it's a little bit different in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because we can, of course, when we use energy, we can use renewable or fossil fuel, non-renewable. 
So we can change the composition of the energy that we use, use and therefore change uh, the rate at which we generate greenhouse gas emissions. But I've done a bit of a simulation exercise and have shown that unless globally we move to a steady state economy, we'll never reduce greenhouse gas emissions to the level required to stabilise, stabilise the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the, the earth will just get warmer and warmer and warmer, which will be obviously very, well, will be catastrophic. Um, so if we think about a transition to a steady state economy, uh, we might have something like this. So here we've got Q rising, but then levelling off. Okay, R, okay, rises, but the gap between R and Q uh, shrinks as E rises, technical efficiency of production. Right, and you're able to remain uh, below the dotted line where the ecological footprint is equal to biocapacity. Sadly, uh, we've, as I showed before, we've done something like that, where R has, of course, exceeded... Uh, the biocapacity of the planet where ecological footprint equals biocapacity. So um, moving to a, a steady state economy means that it's possible to operate ecologically sustainably. Does it mean we have to sacrifice anything? Well, uh, the, a lot of the GPI, uh, genuine progress indicator studies, show that despite GDP rising, uh, economic welfare in the case of many countries is not rising. So it's not as if uh, we're enjoying something uh, as a result of growth. Uh, we, benefits are rising, but costs are rising at a similar and in some cases greater rate. When the economic welfare is just between the benefits and the costs of growing the economy. Um, and of course, uh, if you move to a steady state economy, you can still uh, increase economic welfare by improving the, the quality of uh, the goods that you have, distributing them more equitably, reducing some social costs and so forth. One of the best ways to think of a, uh, a, a steady state economy is to think of a library. Okay, we, we live in the electronic age now, but just imagine in the old sort of hard copy age where you've got a library and it's chock-a-block full of books. Okay, and of course the library receives new books uh, and you can't put new books into the library because it's full. So someone who knows a bit about the area uh, of, the, of the book or the books that are received, assesses that book against the books that are already in the library and if they think that book is better than the book that's already in the library, you chuck that one out and you replace it with the better uh, book. The number of books in the library doesn't change but the quality of the books increases and improves over time. Okay, so that, that, that's sort of how a, uh, a, uh, a steady state economy would operate on that sort of principle. And, of course, you try and limit the number of books that you would be producing. Uh, so you wouldn't want lots of books coming to the library at one time because then you'd be using lots of resources. And you'd be throwing a lot of books out even if you were improving the quality of them. So there, there is a limit to what you can produce to keep the stock of goods that make up the economy or the library uh, at a steady physical state. And that's, that's basically it for today. Uh, I, I, how am I going for time? Oh, it's, it's, okay, well, that gives an opportunity for questions, yeah. Have people got any? Yeah. I was just, with your estimation of the GPI, um, it showed that it seemed like the US was sort of like a series of its GDP. Did you find the same? GDP? No. Yeah, that's a good... Well, I, I, I've, only, I've done some crude measurements for some countries. Uh, yeah, countries like Australia, the US, the, uh, it, is, it is a much smoother uh, transition or uh, change in the GPI over time. Um, for example... Uh, oh, I don't... Maybe I do have it. Uh, I don't know if I can get to it. Uh, I've, I've, I've done some GPI estimates of some... Uh, GCCs, they're Gulf cooperation countries, oil, uh, uh, rich, oil rich uh, Middle Eastern countries. And uh, I haven't got a. Uh, what? Sorry? Yeah, I might save that for Tuesday. But, well, I'll just. Okay, this might not be recorded, but I'll just put this up here for the. And these won't work, of course. Oh, yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia's.
per capita GDP does something like this, and its per capita GPI does something like that. And of course, you, you know what period that is, don't you? It's 1973 to about 1979 when the, the oil prices went through the roof. Okay, so its per capita GDP went through the roof. Uh, it had perhaps the highest per capita GDP in the world, but its per capita GPI uh, wasn't very high for various reasons. And it's fluctuated a lot more than is the case for countries like Australia and the USA. Any, any other questions? Yeah? Yeah. This is probably more for the next lecture, but it's more for somebody who cares about the simple way of explaining how you go about calculating the GPI for accommodation. Yes, there is, but I'll have to give it to you. I'll be giving it to you on Tuesdays. <laughs> uh, you start with consumption. Uh, strangely enough, you don't start because there are such things as green measures of GDP where you start with GDP and, and then you make various adjustments. Well, in fact, uh, the base item of the GPI is consumption. And you might say, well, perhaps a lot of consumption is not good for you. you now, if you eat a lot of Big Macs and eat nothing else, that's not. Well, it's just assumed that the Big Mac nourishes you, but if it makes you unhealthy, it will increase some costs which are reflected in uh, some of the cost items in the GPI. Okay, so it is picked up. And if what you're doing, your consumption is damaging the natural environment, that'll be picked up in the, cost, the environmental cost items. So it's just assuming that whatever consumption there is, it's beneficial in itself. The side effects are reflected by or, uh, or captured by other items. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, there's this idea that you can move towards services and away from goods. Uh, there, there are a number of ways to look at that. Uh, there's, it's a bit of a fallacy that goods and services are, are, are two separate independent magnitudes. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've never had a haircut from an imaginary hairdresser in an imaginary salon using imaginary scissors. I've never been to an imaginary restaurant to get uh, a meal, sitting on an imaginary chair and with an uh, 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 imaginary table in front of me. Uh, the refrigerator out the back of the restaurant keeping the f food cool is imaginary. There's an imaginary chef. So services, in fact, require physical production. And in fact, if you think about it, there are three main sectors of the economy. There's the primary sector, which of course is resource extractive uh, sector, agriculture, there's the secondary sector which is manufacturing and there's the tertiary sector which is services. And basically the output of the primary sector is the input of the secondary sector and the output of the secondary sector is the input of the tertiary sector. So studies have been done tracing direct and indirect resources used uh, throughout the economic process and of course you have to count the resources that are used to produce goods that then become inputs to the services sector. And you find that transitioning towards the services sector does not reduce environmental impact. In fact, if you look at countries like Australia where services constitute about 70% to 80% of GDP, compared to countries where it's about 50 to 60%, countries like Australia have a higher uh, per capita use of resources, higher per capita environmental impact, higher per capita greenhouse gas uh, emissions and so forth. And if you look at Australia, which went from about where services were 50 to 60% of GDP, say 50 years ago, to now 70, 80%, what you find is that all the environmental indicators, the pressure indicators, the impact have risen. So there's no evidence that moving towards uh, services will reduce the environmental impact of economic activity. Uh, the other point that Steve made, it, it, there is, it is possible that we could just you know, uh, engage in uh, poetry sessions, learn how to play guitar, but really, what that really means, that's an admission that we need to move towards a steady state economy, because if we did that, it means that GDP, Q, Q would dramatically fall. Okay? Uh, so that's just an admission that uh, if that is the way to deal with the ecological sustainability issue, it means we do have to move towards a steady state economy. I, I, just, I just went to an economy where um, there's a lot of music being played, a lot of art. It's called Cuba. Very austere place. 
They don't throw things out. They maintain them. They're really good at maintaining old cars and furniture and so forth. Their GDP is a lot lower than Australia. If we move to... And they're very, very contented people, uh, despite the fact, you know, from the point of view of an Australian, it looks like a very, very difficult, hard... Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, makes it somewhat difficult because it's climate, it's very hot and humid, especially the time of, you know, a few weeks ago when I was there. Uh, but you would basically... Uh, if we're moving towards something like Cuba, of course, it means that the GDP of Australia would be falling. We'd be making some sort of transition towards a steady state economy and GDP would be falling, which is referred to uh, by some ecological economists as, as an example of degrowth. If you shrink, and in fact, many wealthy countries may have to uh, reduce their GDP um, uh, when they make the... Tr in order, because their economies have gone beyond the maximum sustainable scale gone beyond them. Um, so, uh, you know, the question that, 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 that's usually asked is, oh, that means we all have to suffer. We don't have to suffer. Um, the, the GPI is not rising all that significantly as per capita GDP. Right? And, and in fact, when I do my adjustment, because I've just read a book by Daniel Kahneman, I don't know if you know much about Daniel Kahneman, he won a Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. He's a behavioural economist, and we hate losses. And uh, uh, we have an aversion to loss, and basically losses affect us twice as much as benefits. So uh, what if I was to uh, double the size of the losses and just maintain the benefits, it's quite possible that... Uh, the USA's per capita GPI may not have increased over that study period. And I haven't got the diagram here, but I'll put it up on Tuesday. I've also broken the per capita GPI up into the different quintiles, the top 20, second, middle, fourth, bottom, and the per capita GPI, without having made this adjustment for the bottom quintile, is exactly the same in 2016 as it was in 1970. So if I make this adjustment, it's quite likely that the poorest 20% of, of Americans, in fact, their per person GPI may have fallen over the study period. So growth hasn't, growth in GDP hasn't necessarily made us any better off because there's an effort, when, you, when you're emphasising growth, I don't know, um, I guess it depends on how old you are, I'm showing my age a bit, although for me it was probably only about 10 years ago, uh, there was one of the, the campaign slogans of one of the major political parties at the federal election was go for growth. Um, I would say go for qualitative improvement rather than go for growth. All right, I, I suppose I'd better leave it there. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Don't worry, these ideas are very, very difficult to accept. Are you it's up to you, but uh, our brains are hardwired in such a way it's very difficult until you read this stuff over and over again, and uh, it's not as as it seems when you're exposed to it for the first time. We're on is, is the. <laughs> Tell us more about that one, Tuesday. Yeah. 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 That would have been recorded. Mm. Um, the students sign it. Actually, we're still recording. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> students before. Maybe I'll turn that off. Oh, thank God yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, can I take this out now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were. They were very interested. In it. And the uh, your graph for the foot footprint. Yeah. Fits what you said. Does it? Because. They've revised that data so that they now say that's 
where they get the 1.7 from. Yeah. Okay. Whereas you were in 1985, you had to go yeah. incredibly far. Well, I guess I'm well, allowed to say that given what yeah, we were yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you've been very conservative. Yeah, oh, yeah I was. So. Yeah. Well, in fact, it is a very conservative indicator. Yeah. Uh, uh, you might want to say on Tuesday, you're not advocating we necessarily turn Australia into China. No, 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 I'm not saying that. But when people respond by engaging in guitar lessons, cooking lessons, yeah. and write like poetry, what you're really saying is yeah, we want to live like you. Yeah, that's really what you're saying. Well, that's, that's fine. That's why I said you could write a song. Yeah. 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 No, that is absolutely fantastic. That was, I've seen you talking about these kind of issues before. Anyway, the point of that story. Man, I couldn't do anything for like a week. Couldn't like, could barely walk for days. I was just like, no granny. And then no cycling, no running. What's the? Does it tell you what the password is? Pardon? Does it tell you what the password? Is? assignments, fails. Oh, cool. <laughs> so if I think it's time of year, I can do it in the tube. Okay. And I've got some notes on that I can go through as well, assignment fails. Okay. Uh, things that weren't done in assignments. I'm hoping that there's a fair few of them here today because I told them that this is a... Yeah, I've tried to make it less boring... Plan. That's not base plan. That's not an elevation. That's an elevation. <laughs>